Good evening. Good evening. My voice, my voice, my voice clear. Good evening, welcome to second day of uh, online course for non-ICU physician. I am Dr. Gulta Kimbekirova. I am a, uh, I am an ICU physician in King South Medical City. Uh, today I will present the most uh, important, one of the most important topic, topic related to ICU, it's arterial blood gases interpretation. As you know, the arterial blood gas is most, uh, most requested investigation in ICU. And uh, I am going to present it and to discuss with you uh, some uh, case studies. Okay, so knowledge of ABG important for doctors, nurses, and the respiratory therapists, and uh, especially it's uh, crucial for uh, critical care uh, unit and uh, emergency departments, as well as uh, operation rooms, where uh, rapid uh, interpretation of ABG and rapid test of, for ABG is uh, requested. Sampling performed under aseptic condition from the radial, brachial, or femoral arteries. And the sample immediately should be placed in ABG machine, which is av available in most uh, critical areas of hospital. Or if it's not av available um, in the departments, it Im immediately should be kept in the container with ice and sent to lab. This is the typical APG machine. We have uh, these machines in all our, our ICU areas, as, as well as it's available in ER and uh, other critical uh, departments of hospital. There are indications and contraindications for ABG. Indications include guide the adjustment of ventilator, recognition of metabolic disorders, making calculations, recognizing uh, respiratory disorders, and contraindications include the absolute and relative con contraindications. So absolute contraindication is abnormal island test, local infection or, dis or distorted anatomy, presence of AV fistula, known or suspected severe peripheral vascular disease. There are relative contraindications, which include severe coagulopathy, anticoagulation therapy, and, and used using uh, thrombolytic agents. Allen test is a simple test which performed for uh, recognition of patency of ulnar artery, which is major artery of the palmar arch. So compressing of radial artery and ulnar artery, and then releasing the pressure over the ulnar artery, and observing the blood supply to hand will give us clue, is this uh, ulnar artery patent and enough for uh, uh, blood supplementation of the hand. It means the radial artery can be used for A-line placement or uh, arterial, uh, arterial uh, puncture. The, on the screen, you can see the normal values of ABG, which, which important to memorize as the knowledge of normal values will give clue about the abnormal uh, reading of ABG. From ABG, we can take other informations as a hemoglobin level, as a hemoglobin, serum electrolytes, lactic acid, uh, carbon monoxide, and methemoglobin levels. 
There are kidney and uh, res uh, kidney, it means excre excretory system and respiratory system standing for each other for regulation of the blood pH. So through excretion of the CO2 and by bicarbonate or production of bicarbonate, kidney and lung, they are regulating the blood pH of the blood pH, it's between 7.35 and 7. Those who is going below the 7.35, it's uh, uh, leading to acidotic state and values above the 7.45, it's already alkalotic state. Okay, one of the important formula in uh, ABG uh, science is the Henderson Hasselbach equation, which, which is simplified from the dose who is, uh, which is utilized in biochemical uh, laboratories. So at the top of, of this slide, you can see the equation, which, which is uh, showing the relation between hydrogen ion and PaCO2 and bicarbonate. This table represents the relation between concentration of the hydrogen ion in, in blood and blood pH. If you can see more hydrogen ions leading to more acidotic state, less hydrogen ion leading to alkalotic state. Coming to six simple steps uh, of reading of ABG. Step number one is this acidemia or alkalemia. Step number two is the primary disturbance, respiratory or metabolic. Step number three is the respiratory problem, acute or chronic. Step number four, for metabolic disorder, what is the anion gap? And step number five, are there any other process in anion gap acidemia? Step number six is the respiratory compensation adequate. By definition, acidemia defined as a pH less than 7.35, and it's metabolic if, if bicarbonate less than 22, and respiratory if PaCO2 more than 45. Similarly, alkalemia, it's a pH more than 7.45, it's metabolic if bicarb more than 26 millimole or 28 in some uh, sources, in this, and respiratory if PaCO2 less than 35 millimeter mercury. Coming to disorders, uh, from ABG, we can recognize the respiratory and metabolic disorders. So on these slides, you can, can see the <clears throat> respiratory disorders, which is oxygenation and ventilation disorders. Oxygenation disorders can be hyperoxemia and hypoxemia. Hyperoxemia, it's usually atrogenic and easily corrected by titration of oxygen. Hypoxemia, can be present with low PaO2 or normal PA, PaO2. So five main reasons for hypoxemia with low PaO2. It means P, PaO2 less than 70 millimeter mercury are diffusion, uh, diffusion problem, for, for example, in fibrosis, lung fibrosis, vacuum mismatch, hypoventilation, low O2 in ambient air, right to left shunting is an intra pulmonary or intracardiac. Normal PaO2 include the, we, we can see uh, seldomly the, uh, the hypoxemia, but same time uh, in ABG, the level of PaO2 may appear the normal. The cause of this can be anemia, CO poisoning, met methemoglobin poisoning, cyanide poisoning, and shock state representing by hypoperfusion. Coming to ventilation disorder, there are two types of disorder. It's a respiratory acidemia and alkalemia. Respiratory acidemia defined as PaCO2 more than 45 millimole, and it can be acute and chronic. Causes for acute respiratory acidemia include, includes traumatic brain injury, anesthesia side effect, and some uh, disorders of uh, muscular disorders and uh, neuropathy. 
Regarding the chronic acidemia, uh, major and uh, well-known cause of this is a COPD. For alkalemia, causes of this is hyperventilation, pregnancy, respiratory stimulants use as a caffeine, for example, and liver failure. So these slides represent the respiratory disorders it causes and uh, how to differentiate. So, just uh, pay your attention the, for this uh, case study because some of the case studies which I will uh, discuss in my lecture today will uh, you will you will, you will find in uh, your MCQ session and uh, practice practi uh, making the practice right now will help you in MCQ sessions. So a patient presented with a one-day history of productive cough, fever, and dyspnea with ABG. A pH of 7.55, PACO of 30, PAO of 63, and bicarbonate 22. So please comment on, on this ABG and make your uh, choice. Okay, more uh, more answers, please. I am following following you on the chat. Okay, thank you. So, majority of you answered the given give the right answer. It's a, it's a respiratory alkalemia and hypoxemia. How to recognize the acid-base disturbances in ABG? So by classification, uh, it's classified to primary and mixed disorders. Primary acid-base disturbances is a respiratory acidemia, respiratory alkalemia, metabolic acidemia, and meta metabolic alkalemia. Mixed disorders, it's a combination of all of these apart from the respiratory acidemia and respiratory alkalemia. So at one time in one ABG, you may see the mixed disorders, but you cannot see the presence of respiratory acidemia and respiratory alkalemia in one ABG at a time. This uh, uh, sketch representing the uh, clinical presentation symptom and signs of metabolic acidosis and alkalosis. Uh, so just pay your attention to this uh, slides, uh, slide and it will simplify your approach to metabolic disorders on the patient bedside. So by knowing the normal value of the uh, ABG, you can recognize the abnormality. So if the pH of, in, uh, of patient in ABG is less than 7.35, so it's the acid, acidemic state. You have to recognize, is it metabolic and respiratory? So again, if it's metabolic, bicarb will be less than 22, and PCO2 less than 45, it will be respiratory acidemia. Next step for metabolic acidemia, it's, it's a recognition, recognition of anion gap. So anion gap you can find by this formula, and normal level is 12 plus minus 4. Next step, it's recognition of the high or normal anion gap acidosis. High anion gap acidosis, it's a presence of uh, anion gap and metabolic acidosis with, with anion gap more than 16. So in this case, you can tell that uh, ABG showing the high anion gap metabolic acidosis. Causes of this, you can see in red box, and you can just simply memorize as a, uh, as a mnemonic mud piles. So methanol, uremia, decay, paraldehyde, infection, lactic acidosis, ethylene glucose, and sepsis are the causes. In case of high non gap metabolic acidosis, you have to calculate the ratio between gap of the anion gap and gap of the bicarbonate. So gap of the, of the anion gap, it's the difference between anion gap in the ABG and normal level. Similarly, gap of the bicarbonate is the difference between normal level of bicarb and which is present in ABG. 
So if this ratio is between one and two, patient having only the high anion gap metabolic acidosis. If this ratio less than one, it's a presence of high and normal anion gap metabolic acidosis together. If this ratio more than two, it's a combination of the high anion gap metabolic acidosis and metabolic alkalosis. For high anion gap acidosis, you have to check the osmolar gap. Osmolar gap normally less than 10. So in case if osmolar gap more than 10, and you don't have any other explanation for the uh, metabolic acid acidemia, you can think about the toxic alcohol poisoning as um, methanol, etc. Another issue for high anion gap metabolic acidosis, acidosis it's a correction the anion gap to the albumin. As you know, albumin is a weak acid. So, the, uh, so for each one uh, gram per deciliter loss in albumin, you have to add to calculated anion gap to 0.5. It will give you give you the correct number of of the anion gap. So we finish with high anion gap and we will move to normal anion gap metabolic acidosis. In this case, we have to calculate the urinary anion, anion gap. And if it's positive, so mostly cause of normal anion gap, it's renal. If it's negative, cause non-renal. Again, in the red box, you can see the mnemonic for normal anion gap metabolic acidosis, fused cars. So by this way, you can memorize them causes of normal anion gap metabolic acidosis. Coming to the blue boxes, again, we are going to alkalemia. We are discussing alkalemia if pH more than 7.45. It's metabolic if bicarb more than 26. Again, if there is metabolic alkalemia, we have to check the urinary chloride. If urinary chloride less than 10 millimole, it's a chloride responsive metabolic alkalemia. Cause for this, vomiting, continuous nasogastric suction, or diarrhea. If urinary chloride more than 10 millimole, it's called chloride, chloride resi resistant metabolic alkalemia with mineral corticoid excess and other hormonal problems. And uh, for respiratory alkalemia, causes of this hyperventilation, pregnancy, and liver failure, and respiratory stimulants. So in this case, you will see the alkalemia with the PaCO2 less than 35 millimeter mercury, less than normal values. Okay, I will uh, skip these slides because already um, it was represented in that algorithm which, which I uh, discussed with you. And coming to second case study, an otherwise healthy 50 years old male sustains acute upper air obstruction during the induction anesthesia. Then he vomits and aspirates, ET tube was placed, and ABG view as the follows pH 7.1, PCO of 70, bicarb of 15, and PAO of 55. Please comment on this ABG. We have some 30 seconds. Okay, thank you, doctors. The uh, majority of you answered <clears throat> rightly. It's acute respiratory and metabolic acidemia and hypoxemia. Case study number three. 56 years old man with COPD and resting PCO2 of 70 millimeter mercury sustains an acute MI. His blood pressure 85 over 58 and he He's the diaphoretic with cool and clammy skin with ABG pH 7.1, PCO out of 70, PA out of 73, and bicarb of 21. You can comment on this ABG. Thank <laughs> you. 
<coughs> more answers, answers, please. More response. So right answer for, for this uh, ABG, it's chronic respiratory and acute metabolic acidemia. Thank you. Now uh, I, will, I will move to slides for uh, uh, bedside in interpretation of the uh, ABG and the rules which uh, you should memorize if uh, you have interest in ABG and if you want, you, you want uh, to know ABG more deeply. So for metabolic acidemia, PaCO2 decreased by one uh, to 1.5 times in bicarb decrease or pH or uh, the last two uh, digit, the digits in the pH should be equal to PaCO2. It means in this case, the process is compensated. For metabolic alkalemia, PaCO2 increased by 0.25 to one times the increase in bicarb. This is a compensatory rules. So in this case, if you will see these compensations, you can, you can tell that patient uh, or organism compensating for uh, some uh, metabolic processes. Okay. And uh, those are uh, ventilation disorders compensation rules. For respiratory acidemia, acute PaCO2 rise of by 10 millimeter mercury, if 10 millimeter of mercury rise in PaCO2 will lead to one millimole rise in, in bicarbonate. This is in, in acute state. For chronic state, this compensation will be four times more. So for each P, PaCO2 rise, uh, by 10 millimeter mercury, by car will be increased by 4 millimole. And that's why in COPD patient, we are seeing the compensation, uh, compensation and the uh, pH for those patients are within normal limit. For respiratory alkalemia, for each 10 millimeter mercury decrease in pHCO2, by car will be decreased by 1 to 3 millimole per liter. For chronic cases, uh, for each 10 millimeter mercury decrease in PaCO2 by car will be compensated by two to five millimole. It will be decreased. This is uh, rules which, which, uh, which we should memorize while interpreting the ABG. And uh, <clears throat> next easy method, uh, it, it is a tic-tac-toe method of recognizing of the, uh, of the uh, disorders of ABG. So it's a indoor game for the kids, if you know. We have to make the six boxes and place the normal value, acidic value, and basic, and, uh, basic value. So let us try. For this ABG with pH 7.25, pCO2 of 32, and bicarb of 18, we are placing the pH in acidic state, pCO2 in basic box, and bicarb in uh, acid, acidic box. So we have here compensated, uh, sorry, we have here the um, uh, uh, metabolic acidosis as pH and bicarbonate, they are placed in one row, if you can see. Okay, for, or, uh, so for uh, the, the determination of compensation, again, we have to memorize these rules. If pH is normal, PaCO2 and bicarb are both abnormal, it's a compensated state. If pH is abnormal, PaCO2 and bicarb are both abnormal, it's a partially compensated state. But if pH is abnormal and PaCO2 or bicarb is abnormal, it's uncompensated state. Okay, and let us try for this APG, pH 7.43, pCO2 of 30, bicarb of 20, 21. So pH is normal, we are placing in the normal box. pCO2 30, we are placing in um, basic box because it's less than normal. And bicarb 
placed in acidic box. So it means patient have the uh, compensated disorders. So pH, as pH is normal. And coming to my last slides, these are multiple formulas which, which, which we, we can use in ICU, but most, most important, important formula from those multiple formulas are first formula, it's called also winter formula, which we, we can use for metabolic acidosis. And uh, we can, by this way, recognize of, uh, respiratory compensation for metabolic acidosis. So, 1.5 times of bicarbonate plus 8 plus minus 2 equal the PaCO2. So by this way, we can see metabolic acidosis compensated by PaCO2 or, or by, by, sorry, the, uh, yes, metabolic acidosis compensated by PaCO2 or by respiratory system or no. So most important formula, you have to memorize this formula for bedside interpretation of ABG. Again, coming to la uh, last uh, slide, uh, how to sing, uh, simply uh, read the ABG. It's a step number one, is processes acidemia is alkalemia. Uh, step number two, is the primary disturbance respiratory or metabolic. Step number three, is the respiratory problem acute or chronic. Step number four, for metabolic uh, disorders, what is the anion gap? And are there any other process in anion gap acidemia? And last, is a winter formula, which I explained before, is the respiratory compensation adequate. So thank you very much. And if you have any questions, you can post in the chat and I am glad to answer you. Thank you very much, uh, dear uh, audience. Now we are moving to next uh, next uh, lecture. Present will be presented by Dr. Ahmed Balshi. He is a senior consultant of uh, ICU in King South Medical City. He will present very important topic uh, related to COVID, and it's a COVID pneumonia from which uh, uh, our patient uh, mainly uh, suffering, uh, I mean, uh, from which they are getting the morbidity morbid and mortality. Welcome, Dr. Balshi, and please share your uh, lecture. Assalamu alaikum. Can you hear me? Yes, Dr. Balshi. Alaikum salam. Alaikum salam. Is my slide sharing now? Yes, sir. Yeah. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I am Dr. Ahmed Belshi, uh, ICU consultant and internal medicine consultant from King Saud Medical City. It's my pleasure today to be with you here in this uh, course number 11 uh, for non-ICU uh, physicians for more uh, knowledge about uh, knowledge about the COVID-19. Today, my lecture will, about, uh, will be about a pneumonia in COVID patients. Uh, up to today, uh, our statistics in the world, we have around 13,338,000 uh, with death about 578,000 with recovery about 7,790,000. In Saudi Arabia, we have a huge number really about 237,803 up to today, and uh, around 2,283 two, two deaths with recovery about 177,500 approximately. Uh, uh, about the COVID-19, as we know now, all we know that this is a coronavirus disease, which is called COVID-19. Which, which is a severe acute respiratory infection caused by a severe acute respiratory syndrome, which caused coronavirus 2. That's why they call the virus name is SARS-2. Uh, but disease itself, we called is COVID-19. We started this uh, pandemic in uh, 2019, uh, late of December in uh, Wuhan, China, and Seafold Animal Markets. 
and we believe that this is the center of outbreak. A clinical presentation for the pneumonia in COVID patients is resembling any bacterial pneumonia. That's why it's difficult to differentiate between both viral and bacterial. We have to put in our minds that asymptomatic patients, that we found them to have similar viral load compared with symptomatic patients, means asymptomatic patient is highly contagious as the symptomatic patient. Most children have mild diseases with fever sometimes without fever or with or without pneumonia. About 80% of all people recovered from this disease without needing any special treatment. They have, some of them have very mild symptoms. They recovered, they doesn't even attend any uh, healthcare center and they just isolate themselves at home and they recovered spontaneously without any interfere from other, uh, by any medications or any special treatment. Regarding the transmission, until now, we believe that this is a droplet transmission, uh, direct or indirect way. Direct when some, uh, when an infected person was sneezing or coming directly in front of the healthy people, or when the infected person who is coughing or sneezing on the surfaces, then the healthy man come and touch this surfaces by his hands, then touching his ha uh, nose or mouth or eyes. Droplet, we have to put in our minds, it's a heavy little bit than airborne. That's why it's not traveling more than six feet, which is about two meters, and do not line in the air. But in certain situations, like a procedures, which is done by the healthcare workers, uh, which generate uh, erosals, uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus can remain for at least three hours. Therefore, we recommend the airborne precautions for these special situations. About pathophysiology, Dr. Waqas will talk in details about it, but just to remind you that the virus have spikes, of which is called S-protein, which is uh, connected to the angiotensin converting enzyme 2, receptors in the alveolar uh, cells and of the lung epithelium. In response to this virus, antigen immune cells start to release pro-inflammatory cytokines and chemokines, resulting in uncontrolled system inflammatory response, which is called cytokine storms. Uh, Dr. Gattanoni is a German physician, uh, anesthesiologist, who uh, studies 150 uh, patients with uh, COVID-19 pneumonia. They found there is a two types of uh, patients with uh, uh, COVID-19 pneumonia, which is called type L and type H. Type L means low. L, low, uh, L from low means low elastance, which is means normal compliance. Low vacuum smashing, low lung weight, low recruitability means lungs doesn't need, needs recruitments. Still a little bit healthy and low beep, we don't need or recommend a higher beep. Like uh, this CT scan cut here of the lung, we can find there is a patchy infiltrations uh, ground glass appearance, uh, but uh, still uh, the, uh, the lungs is a little bit bitter and healthy. With, this is called low type. No need for recruitment maneuvers, no need for higher beep. Regar regarding type uh, H, it's coming from high, all high, high elastance means low compliance, high lung weight higher recruitability and higher beep, which is opposite to low type. Uh, we need to, this is the CT scan of cut of the lung of uh, high type H, which we found most of the lung is affected. There is a ground, huge ground glass appearance affected most of the lungs bilaterally with consolidation here. And this is called heavy lung, stiff lungs need recruitment uh, needs higher beep and mechanical ventilation. What about the clinical features? 
we know that in incubation period until now, what we know this is 14 days following the exposure. Uh, there is a, a mild, severe, critical severity of the disease. Mild cases, the major of the cases was reported in 81% and severe disease means when patient having dyspnea, hypoxia, or more than 50% of lung involvement on the imaging within 24 to 48 hours, which is reported in around just 14%. Uh, persons. Critical diseases, when the patient reached to the respiratory failure and shock state and multi-organ failure and found in 5% of the cases of COVID. But mild disease can progress to the severe disease in 10 to 15 or to, uh, uh, persons, and even severe disease can uh, uh, go to the critical phase with 15 to 20 percent of the diseases. What about virus shedding? Virus shedding was high in early in the course of the disease. That's why patient is highly contagious to others. Virus shedding also can occur in the 24 to 48 hours prior to the symptoms appearing with the patient and can be continued to 7 to 12, 12 days in mild to moderate cases and more than two weeks in severe cases. Patient can be recovered uh, and still BCR positive after symptoms resolve. How we can differentiate between viral and bacterial pneumonia and COVID patient? Actually, it's difficult, as we say before, but uh, uh, some, some hints can guide you. This is mostly is a viral. We know now, especially, especially when we are in pandemic time of COVID-19, any patients coming with lung infiltration we have to rule out viral pneumonia, especially COVID-19. But what are the points can guide us? This is most likely it's a viral pneumonia. It's not a bacterial. When the patient presents, sure, with a history of symptoms, which is coming most commonly with COVID-19 patients, disease, or uh, when you have severe fatigue, myelagia, or you lose your smell or sense sensation, uh, when you don't have pleurotic chest pain, and when you have a history of exposure to known or suspected COVID patients. When we can think about bacterial cause of pneumonia, when you have pleurotic chest pain, when you have a productive cough, more than dry cough and purulent sputum, then we are thinking about the bacterial more than viral. What about the clinical presentation of the patient with pneumonia of COVID-19? There is no specific symptoms, but the common what we observe that is a fever, which is observed in 85 to 90 percent of the patients, dry cough, not a productive cough, dry cough in 65 to 70% of the patient. This is the most common symptoms. Increased work of breathing clinically, fatigue, less common GI symptoms, less common in 3% to 10%, a sore throat, headache, and chills. Uh, there is a different stages of uh, the disease of COVID-19. First uh, is uh, incubation, patient will be asymptomatic, no need for uh, treatments, uh, prodromal, which is symptomatic, but no evidence of pneumonia, then pneumonia, or with hypoxia or pneumonia without hypoxia. Uh, last stage is critically ill patients with shock and multi-organ failure and ARDS-like disease. And uh, the mortality is higher in the last stage uh, in, when the patient is critically ill and admitted to the ICU. And the uh, mortality uh, percentage in uh, ICU patient who was intubated reached to the mechanical ventilation is about uh, uh, between 50 to 70 percent, around 60 percent, and sometimes 50 percent. What about, the, what about the complication of a COVID-19 pneumonia? 
acute respiratory distress syndrome, ARDS. This is what most common we are facing. It's like ARDS, actually. Acute cardiac injury patient sometimes coming with first symptoms of acute myocardial infarction, or sometimes cardiac arrest, arrhythmia, all this is called complications of uh, COVID-19. Secondary infection, sepsis, acute kidney injury, and multi-organ failure. What about physical examination? Same as a, a viral, uh, same as bacterial, inspiratory crackles, rails, or bronchial breathing, uh, respiratory distress, increasing of work of teeth, uh, uh, sometimes tachycardia, fever, and hypoxia. Questions, the most common chest X-ray findings in COVID-19 patients is bilateral lung infiltrates and it's correlate with the degree of hypoxemia. Is it true or false? Actually, these uh, questions have two parts. Uh, the first part is the common findings in chest X-ray in COVID patient, bilateral lung infiltrates? Yes, 75% have bilateral lung infiltrates and most of them have peripheral lung infiltration. Type. Is it correlated with the degree of hypoxemia? No. Uh, uh, the, the chest X-ray is not correlated with the degree of hypoxemia. We can find a patient with very bad uh, uh, chest X-ray infiltration in both lungs, but still patient not hypoxic. And the opposite is true. Sometimes we found a patient with very mild infiltration in the chest X-ray, and the patient is severely hypoxic then the answer for these questions is false because it's not correlated with the degree of hypoxemia. Uh, regarding the imaging, as we talk, we have to follow uh, the uh, policy of the hospitals, institution where you have worked, be, been, have been worked there. Uh, uh, the, first chest, uh, the first imaging to be done is the chest X-ray. And please, when you order the chest X-ray in the patient, try uh, uh, do it as a portable uh, chest X-ray, portable device, why? To avoiding transporting patients uh, to the radiology department and uh, limiting the uh, exposure to the radiologist, other, our healthcare workers. Unilateral lung infiltrates, we can found it in 25% of the patients, but the most common findings is, as we say before, bilateral peripheral lung infiltration, which is found in 75% of the patients. This is one type of the X-ray with severe uh, COVID-19 patients, patient on mechanical ventilation. Next imaging, which is important, we have to highlight on it, is a POCAS. POCAS is a point of care ultrasound. Uh, Ultrasound lung have taken uh, now a very important uh, space uh, rule in, uh, in COVID-19. Why? Because it's accurate and easy to be used, can be bedside, most like, uh, done bedside by a well-trained uh, physician, and you can do it twice, thrice per day no need to transfer or transport the patient uh, uh, to the radiology department. And it's correlating with the severity of the disease and correlating with the CT scan. What are the most pattern have found and observed in patients uh, with COVID-19 in, in Bucas? Multiple B, B lines, multiple B lines is the most common. And another uh, patterns is irregular thickened pleural lines, scattered discontinuation, subpleural consolidation, and alveolar consolidations. This is the ultrasound. We are using the low frequency prop of the ultrasound for the bucus for ultrasound of the lung. And what we can see here this is the uh, vertical lines, white lines, which is called B lines. Black area between the, uh, the B lines 
which which is uh, uh, reflecting the ribs shadow. Just to understand more about uh, the uh, ultrasound or bucus, this is the ultrasound of normal or healthy lung, which is shows a line. When you see in the ultrasound, this lines, a, which called a lines, we can see it here. This is one, and this is one. This is the healthy lung. When you see the this lines the white one, like shadow, shadow here, the white shadow, this is called B lines. And as we say, the black area is the reflecting the uh, ribs uh, shadowing. There is a uh, special places to put the uh, points to check the uh, ultrasound for the bucus. Uh, uh, this is the points laterally and this is from back. See how we can see the consolidations here with some spot, uh, white spots here, uh, which is reflecting air bronchogram in the consolidation lung. This just showing that ground glass appearance in the CT, this is the ground glass appearance infiltration, is correlating with a B line, two B line in the ultrasound, means it's really a good. Uh, imaging uh, uh, modality and saving uh, time and limiting the exposure to the patient, no need to transfer to the radiology department. What about CT chest? CT chest initially in the China was considered as the first line imaging in the patients. Why? Because a patient can have abnormality in the CT uh, chest even before the symptoms started, which can precede the development of the symptoms, even prior of the detection of the positive BCR in patient with COVID-19. But uh, uh, the, the rule of the CT was uh, going down now, limiting for patients only who have uh, unexplained hypoxemia to rule out uh, BE, pulmonary embolism, or when you are going to do the ultra uh, CT scan for other reason like trauma patient uh, or CT scan for the abdomen, for the head, patient not waking up, better to do go at the same time and do the CT scan of the lung. But it's not first line modality. What, what are the patterns in general, not in COVID patient? I'm talking in general to understand what we, about the abbreviation, medical abbreviation of the CT. This one is called the ground glass appearance, which is the most common pattern found in the uh, COVID-19 patients. And this is micro uh, nodules found here. And this is the nodular lesions, one, two, three. And this is septal thickening in the lung parenchyma. This is cavitation with air bronchogram. And this is the consolidation with air bronchograms and this is pleural effusion. This is what's important we are talking about, is ground glass obesity. Then what are the chest, uh, CT chest findings? The most common is ground glass obesities, bilateral, subpleural, peripheral, or peripheral, a crazy bathing appearance, air space consolidation, bronchovascular thickening, and tracheal traction bronchiectasis. As we say, not routinely recommended to do CT scan. Why? To avoid unnecessary exposure during transport. This is the cuts of the CT, different cuts which showing COVID patient uh, peripheral infiltrations and ground glass appearance. What about uh, molecular testing? Is it needed? Yes, it's mandatory to confirm the diagnosis of COVID patient real-time BCR assay in all patients with suspected infection. From where we will take the sample, we will take it from nasopharyngeal aspirate swab type. If the first sample is negative and patient highly suspected of having COVID clinically and radiologically, then I have to repeat the sample, nasopharyngeal swab again. If the patient intubated, I can go for uh, sputum BCR. 
endotracheal aspirate, bronchoalveolar lavage, when possible if patient intubated. But, but what are the highest rate of positive uh, real-time BCR in COVID patient with uh, uh, pneumonia? Then, is it bronchoalveolar lavage, fluid, bal, or sputum, or nasopharyngeal swab, or oropharyngeal swab alone? The correct answer here is A, bronchoalveolar lavage fluid. Then why we don't do it for all patients who are intubated? Because, because it's an erosal uh, procedure, generating procedure, and carrying a higher risk for uh, spreading the infection to the healthcare workers. What about percentage of positivity of the uh, each sample? As we see here, the BAL is uh, positive about 93%, and sputum about 72%, nasal swab alone 63 and pharyngeal swab 32 That's why when we com combine nasal pharyngeal swab together, the sensitivity will be higher. What are the recommendations? Don't order sputum induction in patients who are spontaneously breathing. Why? Because of risk of spreading the infection inside the room and for healthcare workers. Avoid bronchoscopy unless absolutely indicated. Pulmonary function test or spirometry are not indicated in those patients. Airborne precaution, as we said before, only for erosing procedures such as intubation, extubation, non-invasive mechanical ventilation, uh, or open circuit uh, suctioning or bronchoscopy. Uh, you have, uh, uh, you should have the FIT uh, N95 test. If you fail this test because of facial hair, please consider the air uh, purifying respirator papers, which is showing here in the photo. This, this uh, healthcare worker wearing the papas. What about the uh, rabbit test? Rabbit test, is it recommended? It's not recommended because uh, uh, to be positive, uh, to discover patient who is positive COVID, you need to have, patient should have at least three days post symptoms. Uh, this is the uh, uh, from of the window period and uh, Patients in the window period, the, uh, the rabbit test will be uh, negative while BCR is positive. Uh, from zero to seven days, this is the window period, the rabbit test will be negative. Uh, when start IgM start to be detected, then the rabbit test will be positive. And actually it's starting from day seven and picked up, uh, up eight for day, day 14, then start IgM to disappear in day 21. What about IgG? IgG starting from day 14 and continued. We don't know up to how many months patient will still have immunity post COVID until now. Uh, this is the, uh, the rabbit test. We used, uh, it can be done by putting one drop of the blood of the patients with the solution, special solution then we will see the results. When you have a rabbit test, IgM and IgG, both negative, but BCR positive, this is patient in window period, what we are talking about, this period. But me, patient is COVID-19, but not detected by rabbit test. When you have the IgM positive and IgG negative, then patients in early stage of infection, because the only positive is, is IgM. When you have both IgG and IgM and B B BCR, mean patient is an active phase here in this in here in this active phase, actually after day fourteen. Uh, when you have the uh, positive IgG and positive BCR patient on the late or recurrent or a stage of the infection. When you have uh, the IgM patient me only alone, means patient in early stage of infection and BCR may be wrongly or negatively positive, uh, negative. A false negative BCR and patient having IgM means patient still in the early stage of infection. Uh, 
Uh, what about laboratory findings in patients with COVID-19 uh, with pneumonia? We found the most common findings on CBC is leukopenia and lymphopenia. Lymphopenia is the most common. We found it in 33 to 85% of the patient. Thrombocytopenia is rare. Uh, we don't face it too much in patients with COVID-19. High C-reactive protein and high procalcitonin when you have a super infection. The most important inflammatory markers that elevated in the COVID-19 patient is the D-dimer and ferritin and uh, reflecting the severity of the disease. And uh, uh, increasing the D-dimer is correlating with uh, uh, mortality. And here we can see the D-dimer, uh, some of the patients coming with little bit higher D-dimer, more than one, but we found the patient after one week, D-dimer jumping to more than 20, more than 40, very highly positively, and really it's correlate with non-survivor of the patients, with, it correlate with the death. Prognostic uh, indicators for patients with uh, COVID-19 that indicate that there is poor prognosis, there is a, a, a epidemiological and vitals and labs. Uh, when you have, uh, I think it's uh, explained by Dr. Madi in the first uh, day, but uh, as we see here, the elevated troponin, uh, uh, lymphopenia, uh, high ferritin, and D-dimer more than one or more than 1,000 nanogram. Uh, there is some index can uh, 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 show us that patient from beginning, he has the severe COVID-19 uh, disease, or he will develop the severe disease in the course, which is called COVID severity index one. COVID severity index one depends on the neutrophils and lymphocytes ratio, absolute numbers of the neutrophils and lymphocytes ratio. Uh, multiply by C-reactive protein, multiply by D-dimer, all over 10,000. When you have the uh, score of uh, uh, zero to five, then the patient have mild disease and can be treated out as outpatient. When you have a score of five to 20, patient have a moderate disease or mild can be admitted to the general ward. But when you have a severe uh, 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 and score of above 20, patient is really have a severe disease and very sick and he should be in ICU. Uh, what are the, uh, the recommendation for management of patient with the pneumonia and hypoxic pneumonia with respiratory failure? Uh, always start with oxygen by nasal cannula or simple uh, face mask or non-rebreathing masks. Consider early intubation to avoid use of erosing of non-invasive mechanical ventilation or emergent intubation. Actually, it's not 100% accurate because now with the, our practice with the COVID patients since the four months, uh, we found that uh, uh, try to, the better is not to intubate the patient unless really need intubation when you have respiratory failure because when you intubate the patient is difficult to be extubated and the mortality will be high. When we now, we, in our hospital, we have a facility of uh, uh, high flow nasal cannula uh, and uh, oxygen, and we are using, and really it's uh, using high flow nasal cannula oxygen is avoiding patient from going to mechanical ventilation. When you are going to intubate the patient, please use the rapid sequence intubation and avoiding bag mask valve uh, of the patients. Uh, due to high droplet uh, or sp spread, avoid direct laryngoscope. Use the video laryngoscope to keep a, a big distance between you and the patients. Uh, use protective uh, ventilation strategy uh, when you have ARDS and prone the patient, put the patient in prone position, even if the patient is not mechanical ventilation, even if the patient still is spontaneous breathing, I'll ask him to self-proning himself and which is improving the hypoxemia. ECMO, when you have a, a refractory hypoxemia and you will refer the patient to the ECMO team for uh, checking the criteria for ECMO, if he really fit for ECMO or not. Uh, last questions about uh, scenario, 55 years old male, has a hypertensive on Captobril, just returned from Italy one week back, 
presented to your clinic five days history of fever, upsetting dry cough with the history, no history of running nose, or he denied any contact with COVID-19 patient in the past. Uh, he have a fever, 38.9, and tachycardic, saturation 90 in room air. He also suspect COVID, but nasopharyngeal swab came negative. What, a chest X-ray normal. What is your action? Because this patient have a moderate uh, uh, or uh, really uh, alarming symptoms, which is tem uh, temperature 38.9, tachycardic, and he coming from pandemic area, and first swab is negative, while the patient have a highly suspicion of the uh, COVID-19, then the answer is to admit patient to the hospital, C, admit patient to the hospital isolation room. Why you admit the patient? Because patient is hypoxic on room air, uh, hypoxic have a, a saturation of 90 and he require oxygen and repeat the nasopharyngeal and oropharyngeal swab and the request CT scan chest because the chest x-ray was normal in the beginning. Thank you. I think this is the last slide and this is the uh, transporting device what we are using capsule which is called capsule COVID-19 capsule. We are putting the patient on this capsule while transporting the patient from department to department or inside the hospital or to other hospitals. Thank you for your uh, listening and uh, for any query, any questions, I'm ready to uh, hear from the audience. Thank you too much. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Very interesting lecture. Thank you, Dr. Agultakin, for uh, this nice uh, arrangement of the course. Thank you, sir. Any questions from the audience? Until now, there is no questions, Dr. Thank, thank you too much. I think clear for all. See you. Thank you. Thank you. Just one question, Dr. Bashir, one, one moment. Yes. Person, uh, there is a question about percentage of silent hypoxia. How much the, how much the percentage of uh, silent hypoxia? Silent hypoxia, we, can, we face it. We, we saw some patients with the... Uh, uh, silent hypoxia, but it's not an, a huge number. Uh, we cannot uh, have an exact number of uh, percentage, but approximately around uh, 5 to 10 percent of patients may have silent hypoxemia. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So, next presentation will be done by Dr. Wagas. He's an IC consultant. And he will talk about the pathogenesis of the COVID-19. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam, Dr. Ogasi. Welcome. Thank you very much. Just let me share. I think it is uh, visible now. Huh? Hello. Yes, Dr. Rokas. Yes, okay, thank you. Bismillah Rahman Rahim and uh, welcome everybody. So this lecture actually to be presented yesterday, but because uh, every one of us busy, so I got busy, so I could not present yesterday. Anyway, so I lost of uh, sequence a little bit. And you will go through these slides and you will understand the pathophysiology. Actually, this uh, slide and this lecture is based on uh, the concept presented by anesthesia anesthetist uh, consultant, Dr. Gatti Noni, with his colleagues uh, in Germany and later on published in many international uh, journals. So uh, let's see what he says. So this is the most uh, popular slide uh, we have seen in multiple journals and it shows the pathophysiology as we can see as sars cov 2 it uh, binds to the S2 and takes the S2 receptors inside with radial entry replication and it causes the S2 receptors down regulation. So next slide, it will be explained further. We can see this uh, angiotensinogen protein is converted into angiotensin 1 by renin, then angiotensin 1 is converted to angiotensin 2 by AS1 uh, enzyme. And at this level, uh, what is usual mechanism? Angiotensin 2 uh, is acted upon by ACE2 
and it is converted to a very useful good protein, which is uh, angiotensin 1 to 7. And what are the effects? These proteins will cause vasodilatation, anti-apoptotic effect, anti-fibrotic, anti-proliferative. So these combined effects will cause decrease in blood pressure. Fibrosis incidence will decrease. It will cause the re decrease thrombotic events and decrease ARDS. So at this level, if the COVID positive patient or having SARS-CoV-2, then what will happen? The ACE2 will be down-regulated. So this pathway will be obstructed. So what will happen? Angiotensin 2 will be accumulated and it has more chances to act on the angiotensin 1 receptor. By activation of this uh, receptor, it will cause just opposite effects of what is supposed to happen before. So just opposite to that, it will cause uh, vasoconstriction, increased inflammation, increased fibrotic events, increased proliferation. So it will lead to the increase in blood pressure, cardiac fibrosis, and of course, arrhythmias, everything, increased thrombotic events, and ARDS. So this uh, actually mechanism is a down regulation of the ACE2 receptors, and this leads to the accumulation of angiotensin 2, which acts on the angiotensin 1 receptors more and causes its drastic effects. Uh, so where are these ACE2 receptors are found? We'll find in the brain, we'll find in the lungs, we'll uh, find in the intestines and in the testicles. So disease course, uh, it can be of three types of, uh, the disease can take three patterns, uh, like it can present with hyperacute phase, like severe hypoxemia from the beginning and leading to immediate intubation. It can be indolent. Initially, the patient has moderate severe hypoxemia and continue with that and recovers. And the third type of course could be biphasic. Patient present with the indolent uh, phase with the five to seven days and then suddenly collapses and need uh, severe hypoxemia and intubation. And, uh, <clears throat> sorry, we can see the uh, pictures. This X-ray is almost uh, minimal changes and this X-ray is totally destroyed with the consolidation collapse and ARDS-like picture. So different pathologies could be, you can find in the COVID cases like here, uh, we can have the consolidation, we can have this uh, ground class uh, crazy paving appearances, and even the mediastinal lymphadenopathy is noted in the COVID cases. So this is the gentleman, Gattinoni, who presented his uh, theory about the ARDS management in the case of uh, COVID uh, positive case. So what was his theory? We'll go through these slides. Here, uh, this uh, was the article which published in ATS Journal, and he says uh, COVID-19 is not always typical ARDS. And uh, he said uh, further in the editorial of uh, this Intensive Care Medicine Journal that uh, this, uh, these factors can be divided in the three categories, A, B, and C. In the A category, he said the severity and the grade of infection how the infected person responds to the disease and uh, how the physiological reserves is having, how cardiac function, how is the kidney functioning before the disease like this. So this is also important. And what are the other problems he's having like uh, hypertensive, diabetic, ischemic heart disease, any immunological medications he's getting like this. And uh, second thing, once if the patient is intubated, that how he will respond to the ventilator. And the third, when the patient presents to you, time between onset and the patient observed in the hospital. So all these factors are modifying the disease pattern. <clears throat> so these, uh, these factors were actually classified and also I was noticing Dr. Balshi has presented uh, this slide. So this is actually classified factors by the Massachusetts General Hospital. And uh, they said uh, divided into three epidemiological factors, vital signs and labs. In the epidemiological factors, uh, age, they said more than 65 with pre-existing pulmonary disease or patient having a chronic kidney problem with uncontrolled diabetes, hemoglobin A1C more than 7.6%, either he's having hypertension, he's having cardiovascular disease, or he is obese with BMA of more than 30, or uh, use uh, this monoclonal antibodies or the patient has undergone some transplant of kidney or liver and he's on immunosuppression and uh, or patient is HIV positive with the CD4 count less than 200. 
one of this epidemiological factor plus one of the derangement in vital signs or epidemiological factor or derangement in the labs, then there are high chances that his disease uh, will progress to uh, severe category. So what are the vital signs? Uh, if respiratory rate more than 84, heart rate more than 125, saturation less than 93 on room air, and PF ratio less than 300. And the labs will find if D-dimers more than uh, 1000 or 1, CK more than twice upper limit of normal, CRP more than 100, LDH more than 245, elevated troponin or uh, on presentation, uh, the lymphopenia less than 0.8 and ferritin 500. So if one of the epidemiological factor present, along with disturbance in the vital signs in this category or epidemiological factor with the one of the uh, this lab's uh, abnormality, then there are chances that uh, the progression of the disease will be uh, to the severe category. So as I told before, there are receptors on the lungs in the brain. So in the lungs, uh, it will once the receptors are activated, then what will happen? There will be imbalance between the VQ ratio. High perfusion and low ventilation will cause uh, dead space and later on collapse and shunting process, ARDS, everything will happen. As the receptors present in the brain, so the patient can have anosmia, he can be delirious, he can have the cognitive problems, and even patient can get uh, cardiac arrest involving the midbrain uh, respiratory problems or uh, midbrain involvement, he can have uh, cardiac respiratory arrest even. So this slide is important. It uh, summarizes how the things uh, going on in the COVID patient. So as I told, uh, there is imbalance in the high perfusion, low ventilation. It will increase the dead space. There can be microthrombi and the shunt process. So what will happen? Patient will develop hypoxemia. To overcome this hypoxemia, he will try to take deep breaths and his work of breathing, rapid and deep breath, his work of breathing will increase. Once work of breathing is increased, uh, it means he want to take deep breaths and increase his tidal volume himself. So every increased tidal volume <clears throat> will, what will cause, it will cause some damage to the lung. Because as we see, once the patient is intubated, if we give high tidal volume continuously, it can cause uh, damage to the lung. So similarly, now the same mechanism, patient is applying himself on his lungs. So what will happen with that breathing, increased tidal volume, it will cause lung injury, but it is, will be called patient self-induced lung injury. Similarly, once uh, neurotropism, uh, the receptors activated, he will have increased respiratory drive and will have increased work of breathing, increased uh, tidal volume again, and again, patient self-induced lung injury. Similarly, if sepsis of any type, increased metabolism, increased work of breathing, increased tidal volume, patient self-induced lung injury. Plus, there is acute lung injury directly by the COVID. So these two factors by uh, self-induced, uh, patient self-induced lung injury and acute lung injury by the COVID virus itself. So it will cause lung injury. And the same, uh, this patient self-induced lung injury, this phenomenon was explained also before by the uh, Barag and uh, Macaroni in 1988 and 1938, and it was published in the elite journals uh, at that time. So all these factors, which I've discussed early, ABC, where they interact, and finally with the time-related uh, disease spectrum, you can get uh, two types of uh, disease spectrum, according to Gattinoni theory. We can have L type and H type. What is L? L stands for low, H for high. What are highs and what are lows? We'll discuss further. So as I told, hypoxemia, it will cause dysregulation of pulmonary perfusion, and it can cause <clears throat> two type of uh, disease pattern. This is phenotype L, phenotype H. What is L? Low for everything, like low elastance in the lungs, low VQ, low recruitability of the lungs and limited PEEP response. So all this L will be, this lung is called as Pagatinino, who's having these features will be phenotype L. The other type of lung, which is found uh, during the probability and high right to left shunt and higher PEEP response. So he labeled this type of lung phenotype H, 
And actually this phenotype patch type of lung is actually typical ARDS. That's why his uh, first article in the intensive care medicine journal, he said every ARDS is not typical. We can have a typical ARDS where we are having the lung with low elastance, low VQ, low recruitability and limited PEEP response, okay? And uh, this one, H type, which is typical ARDS, which we know everything written in the book. So this type of lung is S type lung because it is heavy lung, edematous lung, having high elastance, high recruitability, high right to left shunt, and this is more PEEP response. So he said the management is different in different patterns of ARDS. Now the same uh, vicious cycle, first uh, there is lung injury, then impaired gas exchange, lung elastance, increased respiratory drive, patient self-induced lung injury, it will lead to the capillary leak. And now the, which, uh, the initial, which was dry lung, now it has become edematous lung, heavy lung. So this uh, phenotype change from low to the high. So this is the uh, problem which we are facing once the patient is intubated. So according to Gattinino, we should uh, change our, uh, change our uh, practice of uh, ventilation depending on the L-type lung or H-type lung. They, found, uh, they also presented uh, one patient uh, from uh, under treatment under them. Then they found uh, this uh, one CT cut of this patient. He was having PF ratio of 95. And uh, you can see most of the lung areas are aerated. Very less areas are not aerated. And after seven days, now hardly few areas aerated and most of them are gone with the edema, collapse, uh, consolidations, everything. But PF ratio didn't change much. You can see here. Uh, 95 and PF ratio here 84, not changed. But if you see the CT, it is totally destroyed. Here, it was most likely the L-type lung and it's changed to heavy type of lung, edematous lung now. Now, what they were, uh, so how did they approach the patient? They presented some uh, way to approach such patients. What they did, they were giving 15 liter of oxygen and they want to keep the saturation more than 95. If with this 15 liter of oxygen, if they are keeping the saturation 95, of course, uh, seeing the patient clinically that he's not exhausting and something like this, they consider it mild. And if it is uh, not maintaining saturation more than 95 on 15 liter, and they labeled it moderate to severe. So uh, the mild cases, they could use uh, this high flow nasal cannula and uh, CPAP. CPAP and high flow nasal cannula, or if it is moderate to severe, most of them cases were intubated. The other way to know that how much work of breathing it is increased uh, or it is uh, tolerable work of breathing, uh, we can insert the center line, and the center line should be in the subgiven vein. And we can see the swings in the center venous pressure in the inspiration and expiration. If the difference between these swings in the inspiration and expiration is less than 10, we can say that patient has uh, low work of breathing, so we can use in these patients high flow nasal cannula or CPAP. If the same swings go more than 15, they intubated the patient. And after intubation, the mechanical ventilation management based on L or H type. Actually, uh, this is uh, the slides to be presented, uh, I think, tomorrow, and I will skip it. This is the protocol followed in the King, uh, here King South Medical City. So next uh, slides, uh, what they did, if patient is having high work of breathing, like swings in centibular pressure, more than 15 centimeters of water, they intubated the patient, and after intubation, uh, their targets uh, were, they want the saturation 1994, PO2 around 60, PCO2 around, uh, you can say, around 45, and keep the pH more than 7.3, and plateau pressure less than 28. So uh, these targets, how they tried to achieve, they kept the tidal volume 8 ml per kg body weight, PEEP of 8 initially, and respiratory rate uh, to go for the end tidal CO2 around uh, 35. And then if they achieve these uh, targets, then they went to check driving pressure. Driving pressure can be checked by checking the plateau pressure and PEEP, plateau pressure minus PEEP, and it should be less than 15 centimeter of water. If driving pressure is uh, less than 15, it means we are achieving our targets. So they continued with that tidal volume of 8 ml per kg body weight. 
if they were not achieving this target, it means the driving pressure, uh, we are damaging the lung. So they went down to reduce the target volume to 6 ml per kg body weight. This reduction in target volume, 6 ml per kg weight, if you read the typical ARDS management protocol online, you'll find this one, uh, the 4 to 6 ml per kg body weight to manage the typical ARDS. But in the other case, where the driving pressure already achieved by these settings, they continued opposite to that uh, recommended in the typical ARDS management, they went with the higher target volume relatively more than this. Four to six is recommended in typical ARDS, but here they manage this patient with the eight ml per kg body weight. So this is the way they were managing with the uh, L type of lung with high, relatively high target volume and typical ARDS lung with relatively low target volume as per typical ARDS protocol. In the next way, if uh, they were unable to achieve the saturation uh, more than 90, and uh, they are reaching FIO2 of 70%, and then even reaching by FIO2 of 70%, they were unable to achieve this saturation. What they did next, they increased the PEEP, which was uh, initially started with the eight, they increased by two centimeter until it's reached 15 centimeter of water, and they added neuromuscular blockage. So patient is paralyzed now with gradual increment in the PEEP reaching up till maximum of 15. And these were the targets again, what I described earlier. Again, plateau pressure less than 30, P and uh, this uh, driving pressure less than 15, PCO2 same target, PO2 like more than 60, saturation 90-94. Okay, now uh, in the next step, if still with this neuromuscular blockade and with the reaching PEEP of 15 centimeter, they didn't achieve this target uh, of saturation of 90 and FIO2 now increasing more than 0.7. Then they check the compliance of the lung. Compliance of the lung, uh, they checked if it is more than 40, it means this is still a compliant lung. Compliant lung means this is uh, L type of uh, lung. So what they did there, uh, they said, we keep the target volume of 8 ml per kg, but don't increase the PEEP 8 to 10 because this uh, lung has the less probability of recruitability. The recruitment of alveoli is uh, less uh, possible with the increasing PEEP in such type of lungs where already lung is compliant. Mean compliance more than 40, it's satisfactory. So they continued with the target volume a little bit higher, 8 ml per kg, which is opposite to the typical ARDS. And they kept the PEEP, 8 to 10 moderate PEEP, which is again opposite to typical ARDS management, where you keep the PEEP high and keep the target volume low. But here in the LTAP of lung, which was compliant lung, they kept the target volume high and PEEP low. On the opposite side, if they found all these, with all these settings, everything done, neuromuscular block had started and PEEP reached 15 already and we are not achieving the target saturation 90, FIO2 more than 80% now or 70%, more than 70% and compliance we see also more than 40. Then they went for the typical ARDS management protocol where we need high PEEP, low target volume relatively because uh, this uh, lung is high recruitable so we can go with the PEEP high and prone positioning was also responding in the typical RDS patient. And uh, there's a tip, uh, another mode, APRB mode in the ventilator, we can help. Uh, next, uh, so what happened? In spite of all these modifications, even APRB mode for update and patient is prone and APRB mode more than six hours and there is no response to the treatment and still patient is uh, desaturating and FIO2 increased already more than 70 to 80%. So we can refer this case to the ECMO consultant. He will consider this uh, extracorporeal membranous oxygenation is a solution or not. If the patient fits in the criteria of ECMO, then of course we'll go for uh, veno venous ECMO and there is chances that patient will survive. If for example, this patient is unfit for ECMO, doesn't fit in the criteria of ECMO, then I think we should uh, go for the, uh, the uh, the discuss with the family and uh, also review the targets, strategy, everything. And uh, we can decide about the DNR or something like this. So this is the way the Gattinino and his colleagues uh, applied uh, their knowledge learned through the COVID uh, era. And uh, they said that every ARDS not to be managed as per typical ARDS protocol, but there are few lungs which have uh, low recruitability, low elastance that should be managed with the 
high tidal volume and low peep rather than low tidal volume and high peep so that's the that made a difference uh, story while managing the patient so now we have uh, two type of lungs while managing the rds l type lung and h type lung so this in summary early recognition of hyperacute disease is necessary short and judicious use of cpap and non invasive ventilation like high flow nasal cannula i mentioned in the uh, the cases where we can use where uh, the work of breathing is very low we can use this and uh, early differentiation of l phenotype because if of course if you give very high peep to the lung which is uh, not recruitable of course uh, you will destroy the lung by giving high peep and the low tidal volume will has uh, own effect so we have to manage based on the l type or h type lung anyway things are getting better now and inshallah uh, we'll get bed mode thank you very much thank you dr bogas there are several questions in the chat we can go through so one of the question hyperventilation causes lung injury in lung pathology or generally speaking otherwise in athletes should die otherwise the athletes should die very early of pulmonary failure uh, sorry i could not hear can you repeat the question so there is question that uh, uh, patient uh, self induced uh, Uh, lung injury yes okay and uh, uh, the uh, i mean doctor is he's putting link between the patient self induced lung injury as a result of hyperventilation yes. and the athletes he's asking <clears throat> athletes also hyperventilating why they are not developing the uh, pulmonary injury pulmonary failure because of course uh, this is uh, the uh, there is additional pathological mechanism and uh, of course uh, everybody is not hyperventilating to the extent uh, to improve his uh, any oxygenation this is a typical uh, problem with the covid the patient have uh, happy hypoxemia okay so nobody will uh, start uh, breathing to the level to maintain uh, saturation so of course he will exhaust so here we have pathology and in some other cases we don't have a lot of pathology for example if i start breathing tidal volume myself i don't have underlying pathology so less likely i will develop this self induced lung injury okay other questions how to differentiate l and h type of uh, h type of ear this at bed side those need ct chest or other measurement uh, yes uh, ct chest uh, usually for example uh, if your patient is having pf ratio now uh, dropped already is falling in the criteria of ards let's say less than uh, 300 that is the one of the criteria so and you do the ct and the, in the ct picture you find uh, the uh, the pf ratio is disturbed already but this uh, consolidation collapses and the other picture like uh, ground glass opacities are not too much then uh, don't go for this and no atelectasis this is picture especially because atelectasis means uh, your alveoli are already blocked so if no atelectasis i don't think so you should go for the uh, this uh, high peep or something like this but most important thing uh, this uh, l type h type cannot be diagnosed uh, in the spontaneously breathing patient frankly we can have only this when in controlled environment patient is intubated and ventilated then we can compare the things mm -hmm. other question criteria for ecmo this is a uh, different actually uh, if patient is uh, not improving continuous uh, having high co2 or uh, the severe hypoxemia and uh, already you are reaching the fio2 more than uh, 80% so i think and already destroyed lungs and the pressures uh, in the ventilators it are giving high pressures then i think we should refer early to the ecmo because uh, sometime early referral even they have seen in ecmo cases actually this is surprising surprising thing but even referral to the ecmo center they have observed a decrease mortality in general ards cases so early referral as per uh, i mentioned like uh, severe hypoxemia high pressures and uh, co2 retention then we should refer early to the ecmo consultant thank you dr vagas there is no more questions thank you okay. and we are uh, 
We're moving to the next presentation, which will present by Dr. Ahmed Kohel. Thank you, Thank, Thank you, Dr. Ugas. Thank you. Thank you. Again. Yes. So next presentation by Dr. Ahmed Kohel. He's uh, our uh, associate consultant, and he will present uh, the ERDS, topic ERDS. So welcome, Dr. Ahmed. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullah. Good evening, uh, everybody. Thank you for uh, this opportunity to present uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome, which is uh, common in ICU, especially in the COVID uh, uh, crisis. Uh, a lot of patients, the main presentation, the main ad cause of admission to ICU is hypoxemia, and they are complicating with advanced or severe ARTS. So here we will. Uh, Go uh, initially what uh, uh, the definition of ERDS, which it was presented in 19, 1994. Uh, according to the criteria, it was it is acute and resistance, and there is radiological finding with the bilateral pulmonary infiltration. So the oxygenation, the problem with that, there is a called PF ratio, which is the BAO2 which is we compounded in the ABG and the fraction of oxygen uh, given by ventilators. So it should be less than 300 in uh, mild, 300 to 200 by moderate in uh, 200 to 100 and less than 100 uh, is it uh, severe. So we have to exclude uh, from this definition who has cardiogenic uh, disease, which is um, uh, or other uh, causes uh, like here they consider because at that time it was swan gas is uh, still uh, using so they can measure uh, the pulmonary artery catheter occlusion it was more than 18. So this is an x-ray of uh, ARDS if you found there is bilateral infiltration with uh, pulmonary edema uh, so here, the acute respiratory dis uh, distress uh, syndrome as acute Ber Berlin uh, definition. The timing, so because you have to, there is some criteria, you have to keep it in your mind. The timing is less than one week, and there is the chest imaging. Uh, there is bilateral obesities, and actu actually now you could not rely only on the chest imaging. They didn't specify it is X-ray only, because it can be X-ray, it can be CT, and it can be ultrasound because CT and ultrasound uh, lung is more accurate. So even the, uh, you have to keep in your mind this is non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema because if you have cardiac failure either systolic or diastolic heart failure, so you have to, uh, it will be rolling out of ERDS most likely. So as we mentioned here, the oxygenation uh, just before it's uh, categorized to three groups, mild, moderate, severe, according to the BF ratio. But the most important to say this is acute respiratory distress syndrome should be the BF ratio below 300, 300 or below. And the, the CPAP requirement of beep of, uh, sorry, the beep positive end expiratory pressure more than five. So this is the categorized because we, what is the importance of these categories uh, to say this is mild, moderate, severe, because when we go more severe, will be more mortality. So uh, especially in the COVID-19, usually we have, as mentioned Dr. Bachi just now, we are avoiding the intubation as much as we can, except if the patient extremely needs the intubation because per se COVID with any intubation have high mortality. So we are trying to avoid, usually once they intubated, they are in the severe ERDS and the mortality is very high actually, unfortunately, especially in the COVID. But in the non-COVID, the mortality is 45. So um, uh, here we can, um, so we just, uh, uh, here, what are the most common causes of uh, you know, this? Can you write in the chat room? Is it pneumonia? Is it sepsis? Is it trauma or inhalation injury? So you can write in the chat uh, room, please.
Okay, so there is some they are saying pneumonia, some they are saying uh, sepsis. We can see the causes of pneumonia in this um, diagram. Pneumonia is presenting 40%. So the 40% of patients we have, um, uh, of the causes of ERDs is pneumonia. Then the second uh, cause is sepsis, the third is aspiration, then it can be trauma, transfusion, blood transfusion, and other causes. So here in general, this is, it can be direct pulmonary injury or indirect pulmonary injury because direct pulmonary injury and pneumonia, it can be bacteria, it can be viral like COVID-19, it can be fungal, it can be gastric aspiration. So it's chemical uh, pneumonia, or it can be drowning, smoking, right embolism, but indirect way, it will be as inflammatory response, like in the patient who has severe sepsis, or it has um, multi, uh, transfusion, blood transfusion, which, which is called the trally, um, transfusion related acute lung injury, shocks, pancreatitis, drug overdose. So we will go now for uh, ventilator strategies, because Usually in the ARDs, we are seeing there's lung protective, protective ventilator strategies. This is very important for any patient in ARDs to, to, to be, uh, uh, it's important uh, plan and important in the management of ARDs. So any patient, once we start the ARDs protocol, we are ARDs protocol or lung protective strategies, which is mean you have to be very careful uh, for a lot of things, because if you give more tidal volume, more positive index respiratory pressure, you will go over volume trauma risk. Patient will develop surgical emphysema, pneumothorax, especially in the COVID-19. We found even the patient with protective strategies, they are higher risk to develop pneumothorax, surgical emphysema. Um, so we have to be more care careful, more um, uh, monitoring for this uh, patient. But if you didn't give enough tidal volume and PEEP, you can go for the collapsing atelectasis, which we don't want also this one because it can cause more uh, injury. So our target to be in the safe area. So you have to personalize your patient to assist what is the best PEEP for your patient. According to that, you will deal with uh, your patient. So don't be over infiltrate, uh, over ventilate or under ventilate of the patient. So this is uh, the line. So here, this is actually in the animals, uh, the X-ray who has, uh, uh, if you can see here, it's uh, collapsing and there is uh, pneumonia also bilateral with aerobronchogram. Um, so the patient is an atelectasis, but after they give uh, some peeps, so here you find this is the plaque is uh, more inflation now. It's opening more the lungs, less atelectasis uh, it became now. So it's uh, considered it's a safe uh, zone. But if you go more infiltration, you will open all the lungs, but here you will be at the risk of um, parallel trauma, as we mentioned. So here, the lung protective strategy is very important to protect the alveoli, to protect the lung from either volume trauma or athletic trauma or even oxygen toxicity. So you could not just keep the patient if I if I do 100 and the oxygenation, keep it 100% of um, saturation. So we don't like to see that. We like to keep the patient in good oxygenation. And there is a lot of variation in this. What is the best oxygenation? Before they are seeing 88 to 92 is acceptable oxygenation. But now there is the new trial they are saying um, what is what is called liberal oxygenation better than conservative liberal uh, oxygenation they are saying the oxygen around 94 is better than the oxygenation of 88 because if you can keep more oxygenation you will be at the risk of uh, oxygen toxicity which is harmful but if you keep the patient in hypoxemia the patient he will develop ha um, the heart disease or which is called the uh, uh, rv failure, more vasoconstriction, more RV failure, because more pulmonary uh, high, more pulmonary hypertension. So we have even the oxygenation is very important to be careful. RV trauma and distension, as we mentioned, 
just now what will happen. So all these problems, if you didn't manage it properly, we can go more complication. So in the ARMA trial, which it was published in um, the New England Journal of Medicine, it was uh, published in 2000, they are uh, comparing between the intervention uh, group and control group. The intervention group, they are seeing the tidal volume is uh, the target four to six ml per ideal body weight uh, per kilogram because we are not just measuring what is the actual weight. No, there is a criteria, there is a method. We can check what is the height of the patient and then we can um, calculate what is the ideal body weight. Because if the patient he ha is, um, uh, is long and the height is 180, the language will be bigger than who has uh, the height of 120. So you have to keep in uh, your mind uh, these uh, things, it's um, it's very important. So here, if they compare between these two groups who has high tidal volume and low tidal volume. So the uh, the high tidal volume, so this is the mission, this is the obese uh, patient, you will not consider as the actual body weight, you will consider as the length according to the height. This is how to predict the ideal body weight or it's called the predicted uh, body weight. So here in the lung protective strategies, what is uh, the lung protective strategy? The tidal volume, as we mentioned, it's actually four to six ml, but keep in your mind the plateau pressure, it should be below 30, and the B positive index bilateral pressure according to uh, the protocol. And here they found in this uh, trial, uh, the actual B is 8.1. So the result, uh, it was the 31 uh, mortality, 31 percent mortality. But when they compare to the other arm who has potential ventilation, the tidal volume we give 12, which is double what they give in the lung protective strategies, and the plateau they keep it below 50. So and the beep as very protocol, but here the actual beep it was around nine. The mortality it was around 40 percent. So it is. When you give more tidal volume, more plateau pressure, you will give more mortality because more lung injury also. So here, this is the ARDS net uh, low tidal volume. We compare it between the low and the high. See, this is how is the different. This is at 28 days uh, mortality. If you see, this is uh, actually this is a pressure control uh, ventilation uh, screenshot. Uh, because we have a lot of mode, it will be presented tomorrow with Dr. Bassin in more details about the mode uh, ventilation. But just here, uh, we will give a, an example. So this is what is mentioned here is the peak pressure. And this is the expiration minute ventilation. This is the actual tidal volume. This is the respiratory uh, rate. And this is the plateau pressure. So if you can find here the plateau pressure, the plateau pressure, it will be at this um, stage. So once we give, you will calculate at the end inspiratory time, sorry, and you will find how much the plateau pressure. This is the last time we check the plateau pressure, how much it was. And uh, the plateau pressure is very important, should be below uh, 30, because if it is more than 30, it will be more lung injury. So usually in the lung protective strategies, you have to keep in your mind the plateau pressure minus the beep. So for example, here the plateau pressure we can say is 30 and uh, the beep of eight. So it will be the tidal uh, volume, the driving pressure, what's the difference between both of them is 22, which is high, which is mean more lung injury. We have to adjust it. So when we are assessing the patient, we have to assess what is the plateau pressure? What is the beep? What is uh, the driving pressure? So this is very important to uh, check and even the tidal volume, what is the ideal uh, comparison to the ideal body weight? So once we ask tidal volume, how many ml per kg? We have to ask the uh, respiratory therapist to know exactly. So this is an example here. Uh, and a question, a question please uh, to answer this one in the chat room. 28 years old male, he has ARDS with severe pneumonia. His ideal body weight is 70. The tidal volume is 420, which they are giving 6 ml per kg. The respiratory rate is 18. Positive end expiratory pressure is 12. 
and uh, if I do the fraction of oxygen is 80%, when you saw the pH here is 7.28, oxygenation is good, 76, and BCO2 is high, 57, saturation is 92, and bicarb is 18. So what you what what to do now? Are you going to get uh, to keep the same setting? Or would you like to increase the respiratory rate to, for example, 22, or increase the tidal volume, or just to give 100 ml of sodium bicarb? Can you write it in the chat room? Any more answers? Okay, so the answers I found is between either to keep the same setting or increase respiratory rate. So in ERTS, actually, if you have the CO2 uh, retention, uh, so here there is CO2 retention, we have to keep uh, in your mind how to improve the minute ventilation. So the minute ventilation, what, what is the minute ventilation? Minute ventilation is the tidal volume multiplied by respiratory rate because our aim usually the uh, CO2 should be around 40 and here it's 57 which is high so you have to keep in your mind I want to improve the uh, ventilation uh, or minute ventilation either by increase the uh, respiratory rate or increase the tidal volume usually if you have the space to increase the respiratory rate it's better than to increase the tidal volume why because as we mentioned if you increase, uh, because the respiratory rate, once you increase it, it will not affect the plateau pressure. But if you increase the tidal volume, the plateau pressure will be more high. Here, not mentioned the respiratory the, um, tidal volume, but it's uh, already 6 ml, their ideal body weight. So we have to keep um, in the language protective strategy. So the time now to play with our, our respiratory rate, not with um tidal volume and if you keep in the current situation so even co2 retention will uh, cause more uh, vasoconstriction which is can increase the risk of uh, rv failure uh, which we don't like to see it in the erds so here there is uh, another screen uh, shot uh, here if you find here the big pressure is uh, 31 this is also pressure control. This is a 31 of peak. Uh, minute ventil uh, ventilation, the expiratory is 6.7. The tidal volume is taking 300, um, around 17. Respiratory rate, uh, 22. The plateau pressure is 16, which is good. So can you measure how's, what's the driving pressure here? If you have the beep of uh, 12 and the plateau pressure of 16. So, what is your plateau pressure here? Can you write it in the chat? So, we mentioned the, the driving pressure is the difference between the plateau and the people pressure. Yes, it's four, but uh, usually this is not in ARDS because in ARDS you will find it usually higher. But our aim should be below 15. So usually the cost should be paid. Sometimes you will allow permissive hypercapnia because you have, for example, a respiratory rate of 30 or 34 you reach and the tidal volume is 6 ml. Plateau pressure is around 30. So you could not increase the tidal volume as far your pH uh, more than 72. And with this maximum um, uh, tidal volume and respiratory rate, so you can allow the hypercapnia. So the beep in ARDS, so what is uh, the optimal beep? Actually, the optimal beep, there is a lot of things now, uh, modalities uh, to adjust it, to how to calculate it and how to measure it. Uh, now it's, uh, there is some uh, pilt, it will be around uh, the chest, you will put it. Uh, external impending um, ventilation, they will use it. Um, so you can attach it and you will adjust the beep every two minutes until you would achieve the optimal people, which is this machine called EIT. 
The others, in, uh, it will be like the NGT tube. It will be inserted in the esophageal as level around uh, 25 centimeter. Then you will uh, calculate uh, the optimum PEEP in the ventilators. Because, as we mentioned, this is the normal. We should be in this uh, stage to avoid uh, atelectasis or volume uh, trauma. So does high beep improve the outcome in ERDS? Actually, the higher beep, you have to uh, be very careful with that uh, to avoid because more high beep will improve yes, the oxygenation, but be careful about the blood uh, pressure and the RV failure. Uh, they will be more uh, beyond that. So here, another uh, question. This is the patient, uh, the same patient. He has uh, control mechanical ventilation. And now he's in a 200%, beep of 12, and the tidal volume for 120. They keep respiratory rate of 20. Plateau pressure is 32. So the ABG showing the base 7.1. VO2 is low, and VCO2 is high. My carb is 18, saturation is 85. So what's the next to improve the oxygenation? Are you going to increase the positive index respiratory pressure, or you are going to plant the patient? Uh, or increase the tidal volume, uh, or put the patient in R. Can you write in the chat room, please? Brown, brown. Yes, we will go to prone the patient because it will improve the outcome, and there is it can be decrease. Uh, the mortality uh, and decrease uh, the mortality. Uh, so in the prone uh, position, uh, you will turn the patient and you see now uh, after uh, some time. So this is the proning uh, position. And uh, so this is the high flow uh, nasal, uh, so the high frequency ventilation. Now it's uh, off-label uh, use because it's not recommended anymore. And this is the nitrous oxide. So, uh, so what we can as refractory hypoxemia, what we uh, should do, what are the causes? So there's actually the refractory hypoxemia, there is no official uh, definition for that. And the PO2 is less than uh, 50. And if IO2 is more than 70%, uh, you are giving the PO2 more than 70 and still PO2 less than 70, the other, they are seeing resistance more than 24 hours of hypoxemia. Uh, despite you are increasing the PEEP, uh, ruling out the reversible uh, cause. This is the um, busy slides, actually. We just um, proceed. So <clears throat> take off, uh, your back because of you may need it for any day. So this is uh, here the prone position. So this is the subine, this is the prone. If you find here, now is all this collapse, this is the aeropronchogram collapsing consolidation. But if you uh, prone the position, all this, it will be in the front. So it will be the secretion here. As you know, this is pneumonia. It will be a bus uh, there, or it can be, there is the non carcinogenic pulmonary edema. All this edema, it will go uh, to the other area. So it will allow uh, recruitment of the lung and uh, this. So uh, here there is another trial, it's called uh, Broziva. This is in 466 with severe RDS, brown position, uh, versus um, subine. And we found there is improving in mortality as uh, at 28 days and uh, 90 days. So there is and this cardiac uh, risk, but they should be trained how to do it because there is risk of self extubation or, um, or not self extubation can be the sludge of the tube and can cause cardiac arrest. So these people, they should be trained properly, the nurses and the RT uh, to be done in very fast way in the presence of those experts for intubation in case of dislodgement. So here, this is the, another question with the FI2, patient with the FI2 of 70% and PEEP of 14, RR of 22, plateau pressure here is high, 32. Uh, pH of 7.29, oxygenation is low, PC2 is, is okay, 49. So what are you going next for the same patient after you prone him the first time? 
are you keep the patient prone for another 16 hours? Put the patient to bind for eight hours, then prone again, or prepare the patient for ECMO, increase the respiratory rate, and give sodium bicarbonate. What are you going to do? So because the idea of a prone, you will keep the patient prone for 16 hours, then you will bind the patient for eight hours. So this patient, the we put him in the prone, oxygenation in FI2 it was 100, now decreased to 70%. So he was improving with the prone, so we'll give him another cycle. So if you remember just now, they discussed about ECMO. The ECMO who failed, who came early in cases, and they failed for the prone after the first cycle. So once the patient improving with the prone position, so they will be out of uh, ECMO with the BF ratio uh, improving. So you will uh, subind the patient for eight hours, then uh, will be prone again. So keep in your mind, the prone will improve the oxygenation about in two thirds of patients. So 66% of uh, they will improve, but some patients they will not improve. Maybe they will worse also. So there is no improvement in survival, but it's decreasing the mortality. And uh, there is no difference in time of ICU or ventilation. Might be useful for patient of refractory hypoxemia. Usually, the prone position is indicated if the BF ratio is 150. So the optimal time and duration still is questionable. Uh, routine use is not recommended, but they are saying less than 150 is recommended. So ECMO, some patients who have refractory hypoxemia, not responding early stage, um, hopeful cases. So we are discussing if the patient also it has uh, we will not discuss ECMO in the patient who has, uh, for example, uh, stage four of cancer, but we will discuss the patient who is uh, young or uh, middle-aged with hopeful case, not a lot of morbidities, because sometimes even some centers, they are, if the patient is candidate for heart transplant if needed and develop a heart failure and possible for the heart uh, transplant. So it um, depends on the situation and where it will be uh, local protocol we have to fill. So because of the matter of time, we will uh, skip this uh, slide. And uh, thank you everybody. If you have any question, you can just um, uh, write your question, please. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Really great, great presentation. Uh, welcome, Dr. I think there is no more questions. Okay, thank you, Dr. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, and uh, we shall see you tomorrow for the last day of uh, our course. Uh, and uh, good night to everyone.